Hello, and welcome to the Marketing Times Analytics Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Safranis, and today I'm on with John Miglosh. John, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, I'm uh, president of the Wisconsin Direct Marketing Association for a number of years uh, as my second term as president, and we've sort of set it up differently, so I'm perpetually the president. (laughs) (laughs) That rotating board put us under a couple of times. Um, So I'm also the founder of Miglosh Marketing um, since 1990 or so. Uh, So I have about 40 years of direct marketing consulting, have launched a lot of catalogs, have worked with about 80 different catalog companies. I pioneered um, the use of computers in marketing, believe it or not, and especially machine learning um, back in the mid 90s. So I've done thousands of machine learning models and put them in the mail, unlike most of the of the uh, data scientists alive today. Hmm. Interesting. So you say you worked with a lot of different catalog companies. So can you tell us about what those placements were like and how they served the customer? Well, the the great thing about catalogs is that they have a lot of items. <laughs> it sounds like it should go without saying, but you know, here's one I'm talking. I, I did actually work with these with this company, and you know, it's just like infinite items. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you know, everybody was crazy about big data and uh, third-party cookies and all kinds of inferential data that you could scrape off the universe. But catalogs, even back at the very beginning. <clears throat> Uh, probably had the problem of too much data rather than not enough, even in the late 80s, early 90s. And so they were intrigued by my um, ability to do analytics with with high volume data, uh, which means that we started with first party data right off the bat. And uh, even then, it's, it's still somewhat inferential. Uh, some of my clients were primarily gift, uh, you know, I had one and he said, and I would talk to him about, you know, his gift catalog and he'd say, well, our catalog is items. It doesn't become a gift unless someone gives it. I said, oh yeah, <laughs> like I'm going to buy world's greatest dad mug for myself. Right. I mean, it's like, he said, well, I admit there are some that are, would only make sense as gifts. But anyway, it was mainly, that was mainly what he was used for. And the problem is, is that when I'm gifting something to someone else, it, it's a first party transaction for a second party, right? So it's, uh, so it's not, it's still not something that I'm going to use. So my decision making process is different, much, much, much more different. And, um, and third party data is, you know, is, is way off in terms of value. And even in first party data, even in transaction data, even at the SKU level, it's, it's very quickly descends into not very valuable. Plus, the average catalog uh, customer buys once. <laughs> the average buys once. 60% only buy once. So hmm. uh, how much can you infer from that? Right? Not that much. Even though it's way richer than someone who hasn't bought at all. And just landed on your site or something. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I faced these problems way back, way back in the 90s. And uh, ironically, the AI people are just starting to face them now. And, and, uh, and I think solving them rather poorly. But that's just my opinion, I suppose. Tell, tell us more about that. So what are some of the challenges nowadays with using AI and machine learning in, um, in marketing? Well, the big problem is, okay, so so back to the uh, premise. Well, there's two, two things to keep in mind. One is that it's easy to find the good customers and say, you know, because my job was mainly, you know, who's worth, who's worth spending a buck to talk to again? You know, we want to send this catalog out. It's $3 or something in the mail. It's big. 
But if we have millions of customers, that's a million, multi-million dollar decision. You know, Cabela's, which was one of our early clients, they would drop 5 million customer names a month. So, you know, whether you got a catalog or not was a big decision for them. Uh, and what they'd been doing was saying, well, if you bought, if you haven't bought within the last 12 months, then we're not going to waste a catalog on you. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much assured themselves that everybody they were mailing was, was worth mailing, which wasn't the case actually it was, it was really massively not the case. Um, because if you bought fishing, uh, it would take three months maybe to get you into the, into the cycle. And so the next catalog you would receive would be footwear or camping or turkey hunting or archery. There's a whole cycle that they went through the, through the year. And then you'd get hit over and over with hunting catalogs. Boom, 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 boom. So you really, you know, you may be interested in hunting. Most of the people who hunt also fish and vice versa. Dick and Jim Cabela did. But the, but just because, like I grew up fishing, so I can go into Walmart and buy fishing lures that I'm going to catch stuff with. I'm not even, I don't worry about it, you know. I don't need to go to the world's finest outfitter to get the right fishing lure to catch something. And I'm also not a professional bass tournament fisherman, so I don't have to worry too much. Right. Plus, I did work with North American Fishing Club and in Fisherman, and both of them sent me massive numbers of books and videos on how to fish. So I boiled it down to fish where there are fish and fish with someone who knows how to fish. <laughs> if you keep those two rules, you'll probably catch fish. Mm -hmm. And so I don't need a lot of help with the fishing lures. But when I started with Cabela's, I took up hunting and I didn't know anything about hunting. So I bought some good stuff out of their catalog. And in fact, Dick Cabela sent me my first bow and arrow uh, set up because I had made them so much money with the modeling. But, but anyway, so their number one customer complaint was, why do you send me all these hunting catalogs? Or why do you send me all these fishing catalogs? Because what we found was that not though, though almost everybody who did one did the other, not everybody was interested in that level of spending or support for both sports. In fact, only about 5%, which is pretty normal. Everybody thinks it's easy to sell something more to existing customers, easier than to find new customers, but often it's not the case. You know, they've compartmentalized your company for fishing, like say Bass Pro Shops, and they don't think of it for hunting, mm -hmm. you know. Now Bass Pro Shops has bought Cabela's and united the two, and I just am not comfortable seeing that Bass Pro Shops hunting catalog. That's what they call it. You know, they should really call it, they should have kept the Cabela's brand, I think, and, and just said, this is, we're going to use Cabela's for hunting and Bass Pro Shops. I mean, obviously Bass Pro Shops is a fishing terminology. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, uh, what we found was that, that modeling – monthly was very, very powerful in resurrecting old buyers and that a fishing buyer could be mailed three or four years in the fishing window, whereas you almost didn't need to mail the hunting buyer at all, the fishing catalog, maybe one, something like that. And so we, we, uh, they told me that we made them $2.3 million the first time we did our system because, like I said, anybody can find the good names. But the good names are not as obvious as people think because there's hidden in the good names are bad names. And uh, also hidden in the bad names are good names. And that's really the task of, of machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. So the challenges now are that people are trying to do machine learning without proper data sets. And that's staggering, if not impossible. Um, it took me a couple of years to figure this out because Gartner, eh, it wasn't actually Gartner. Um, I just researched this because I'm rewriting my book for the third edition. And yes. uh, I actually got in touch with somebody from Gartner. And we together tried to search for where Gartner said that it was 87% of AI projects fail. 
because I'm I was convinced at the time that when the, when that came out that uh, that even higher percentage of marketing AI projects fail. But I didn't know why, and I didn't know why I could in the mid '90s do multi-million dollar incremental lift with modeling when nowadays they still can't get it down. It's a good puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. I knew I could do it. I knew I'd done it, but I wasn't sure why I could do it and no one else could do it or not. Not many people could do it. Well, it turns out that one of the requirements for machine learning is a labeled data set. And that like, uh, when IBM tried to teach Watson to play Jeopardy, well, I think they did pretty well, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't just let watch it. <laughs> I used to skip out of school in high school and walk home and watch Jeopardy. <laughs> so they didn't let yes. they didn't let Watson endlessly watch Jeopardy. It, it, that's not how they did it, right? What they did was they took the historical Jeopardy question and answer set, which they knew which ones were right. They knew the right answers. They didn't need to know the wrong answers if it didn't match up. So they could then come up with an algorithm. Let's say the algorithm was look for proper name, proper nouns and negations. Okay, because negations are really important. <laughs> and a lot of times they're Jeopardy's worded that way. So, uh, you know, something like what state is the first president named after and obviously the answer is Washington right so that that algorithm might for president if it knows what if it knows to treat the president first president as a proper a proper noun it's not really it's president is a generic common mm -hmm. noun but you know if it if it if it's that smart it's going to get it right uh, but it's not going to get um, you know what what is Washington? Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a, a university, a couple of them. It could be a state, could be D.C., could be a president, could be a lot of things. So there's problems with any question, knowing the context. And interestingly, Google, if you do Google search and you type in Washington, it will give you a number of different tries. Whereas Bing will try to guess which one you really meant based on your past history and all that, which is insane. Mm -hmm. Google is more is more humble than Bing, and th but this illustrates part of the problem. What's the context? You know, so in that context, they could tell better better algorithms. Some algorithms would get, let's say, twenty percent correct. Some would get eighty percent correct, and they would, and then or maybe, and then maybe they take the twenty percent and, and they tune it a little more. And it would up the percentage. And they could run it over and over and over and over on this labeled data set. So what would we like for a day, for a labeled data set in marketing? What would we like to know? Well, we'd like to know the key characteristics that identify customers compared to non-customers. Or really, in the case of first-party data, who's going to buy again? What are the characteristics of people who bought again? Versus the characteristics of people who didn't buy again, right? There is no real, there really isn't such a thing as predictive modeling. That That's a complete <laughs> misnomer. What it really is, is carefully analyzing historical data. Because all data is historical, right? The future mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so the best we can do is analyze historical data. And the way we make historical data predictive is with the scientific method. So, uh, so if you said, well, gee, most of the time when I drop something, it falls at my observation, right? And uh, you say, I wonder how how fast it falls, and you fall over and over and over and over. And if you were well, in my day, we had this little machine that made dots on a tape, and you drop a weight off the side of a desk in in high school physics, and you can measure the distance between the dots and you can see the acceleration of gravity. So you can come up with a, a close approximation. Well, not really, because there's a lot of drag on the tape and there's, but you could get, you can, you can get somewhere. Um, 
now, you know, we have cameras and we have vacuum chambers and we have all kinds of things to improve on that. But, but the point is we can make repeatable experiments, right? And we can say, well, it, it looks like it's approaching this acceleration, but, you know, there's air and there's drag and there's et cetera. Um, if, we, if we took those away, maybe it would, maybe it would fall faster. So then you say, okay, well, let's, that's our hypothesis. Our observation is it's close, but probably not a no cigar. So now you, now you do the whole thing in a vacuum chamber and you find out, yes, indeed, it falls faster. You publish the paper, other people repeat the experiment, and we get what we call an explanation that there's this much quantifiable drag on the acceleration in, atm in uh, Earth's atmosphere at this level, et cetera, et cetera. So then you start having... You know, if we dropped a, a bomb out of an airplane, you know, we would have a coefficient of friction and we'd have, it depends on how the object is shaped. And, you know, when you start to develop this explanation base. And then when you get enough confirmation, you get an, a theory. And so that you can say, well, if it's shaped in this way, it's probably going to fall at this rate, more or less. That's how we get predictive data. And then we confirm it. We t retest it, Right. But marketing doesn't like that. Marketing says, well, let's try, let's try this offer, 50% off, okay? Well, and then we get X result. And then a couple of months later, you say, well, that would seem to work. Let's try $20 off, you know, and it's a $40 item. So that's still a 50% off, but let's try that. And you find it gets Y result. And then you say, well, yeah, that's probably good, but let's try buy one, get one free. It's also 50%. And you get Z result. And then you say, well, that means that Y result is better than Z result. And I would say, no, it isn't. You know, you have to do an AB split. You have to do it at the same time because you've got to, to run a proper experiment. You have to cancel out the results. So we have this puzzle in marketing where every, no one wants to, no one wants to slow it down enough to get a, a real a b split to get real predictive modeling so back to the back to on the, that yeah the so puzzle. on that note so are you saying that that marketers aren't running proper a b tests and that's why we're not predictive oh absolutely right absolutely uh i i went around the namoa which is which is uh they changed the name and i never can remember it used to be new england mail order now it's uh, something about national mail and <laughs> online orders, something mm -hmm. or other. I forget what the – nobody remembers what the real one is if they knew the old one. It's rebranding. Uh, and so um, I asked them, do you test enough? These are catalog companies, big, big, well-known catalog companies. And every one of them said no. And they said – the most interesting one that I could name the – I can name the source. They said, well, our CFO doesn't like it when we test because they say, you know, the, the, the loser in the test actually gets less profit than the winner. That's right. Right? Absolutely. By definition, it, you know, almost never a tie. One does better than the other. And the CFO says, well, if you hadn't done this, then profit would have been this. So you've actually eroded the profit of the company, you know. And I lose my bonus or something. Yeah, but you you didn't know which one was going to be best, you know, right? Could have been this way. And it could have been that we would have done way worse if we wouldn't have tested. And in the future, if we're trying to develop theory and prediction, then in the future, we can utilize that information to, in, to carry forward that result into all of our subsequent mailings. So there's a huge... There's a huge upside to testing that isn't considered by the CFO. He just says, well, you're you're eroding margin. Well, I, I think that's a bad CFO. Yeah. I don't think that's representative of the marketing well, of course it is. world. I'd say it really is representative that A-B splits, other than click-through tests, are anything beyond that is very rare. My experience. Well, okay. Uh, in, my, in my experience, it's exactly the opposite, but that's fine. Um, well, good. I'm glad. I hope yeah, that's I, true. 
I personally run a lot of tests. But anyway, back to so but back back to the puzzle. So that's how, that's why we don't get predictive. We don't really do predictive modeling. Let me most let me pause though. Uh, so, I want to I want to mention okay. something. So I recently learned that Google has a ideal sort of spend split where they recommend, I believe it's 70, 20, 10, where 70% um, of your budget is spent on things that you know work. The 10% is like super new, like, you know, basically throw away, like try it on new stuff, don't expect it to work. And then the remainder you should spend on, you know, things that you do know work. And I think that's that middle ground that that CFO that you were talking about was missing, which is that you, that is correct, that you can over test and waste a lot of money, but you can also under test and waste a lot of money. So that it's all about finding what percentage of your budget is okay to use on testing versus on performance. Right. And great mailers uh, will always test every, every mailing will have a test. Let's get back to the why I think AI is failing in marketing. And that is that uh, that label data set. In, in direct mail, we have a label data set. In digital, we don't. We really don't. And any more than we would in outdoor or mass media. You know, if you think about outdoor as, a, as just an example, uh, you put up a big billboard next to the highway and your business goes up, you know stop in for a free hot dog or something and uh but but is there a label data set well you can keep track of everybody who stops in right but what you don't know is how many people went by and saw the ad saw the billboard and didn't stop in you just don't know how many didn't even see the billboard because they were looking at their speedometer or the kids were screaming or something you know whatever reason. You don't know that either, right? And there isn't a way to know. And the same thing is true on your Super Bowl ad, right? Uh, you don't know, you you may, you know, if you have uh, online TV, you know, you may know that the TV was on the Super Bowl, but you don't know how many people were in the room and you don't know if they all went to the bathroom, right? And, and in fact, as hard as I try to watch Super Bowl commercials, you know, when the when the who won the Super Bowl commercial comes out, I inevitably have missed most of them, <laughs> you know, unless I go back and, and and watch them on their own. So even and e so even if you're actually are in front of it and watching it, it may not be registering. Right. Because it just goes by. Right. And digital is in the same boat, except for digital fraud, which means that oftentimes a cookie is dropped on my computer when I didn't even see the ad. It may not even been visible, right? If you go to those, this is how they looked then. You won't, you won't believe how they look now, <laughs> you know, and then you don't even get to that mm -hmm. person. <laughs> I used to go 40, 50, next, next, next. Well, there's ads coming up, and unless you scroll the whole thing, you won't see them, but they're still dropping cookies. So there's incredible level of digital fraud where you aren't even able to see, unlike TV or outdoor. So you've got a problem there, but you've, but you've still got the same problem. And even with Google uh, pay-per-click, you've got, a, you've got a problem. Even Google admits, we don't know the customer journey. You know, you type in big screen TV and up comes something and you click on it and you go there, but you don't buy right now because you've never heard of them before. And you something else comes up and you go away. Now there's a cookie. Uh, you come back, you know, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of noise in there. Okay. So what the conclusion I came to, the startling conclusion I came to was that direct mail has a label data cell set built in, which I didn't appreciate. And what I mean is, is that we know who we sent it to, you know, even when it's 5 million names, we know, we know every name that got sent to so that we can actually, even if there's no tracking code or nothing or no, you know, we can still match back and we can say, well, we may not know the journey, but we know that we mailed this person and within the next three weeks, they placed an order. That's a pretty powerful connection, right? Now you say, well, okay, so that's something, but we have kind of the same thing. You know, we have Google click, we click the, we click 
the link, we went to the website, and within two or three weeks or whatever, we can make it the same, placed an order. That's true. You do have something. You have something, right? Now, you don't know what other external forces happen, but the problem is that you, the bounce rate is 50% on that click, right? And so you, you can give them all the credit, but if, you know, in many cases, let's say a mailer came in, you know, wherever. Here, we go back to the catalog, right? This mailer came to their desk, and they said, hmm, that looks interesting. And they, and they type in the name of the company, which is on the cover. Google brings it up. They click the link. Was that causal? Was Google causal? No, he paid, he paid double. So anyway, back to mail. So we know at least that better than we know it from Google. And we also know, and this is the important part, we also know, unlike a banner ad or a TV ad or something like that, we also know who got the piece and engaged but didn't buy. And that's the part that no other media offers. Engaged, and what I mean by that is, is that we know it gets delivered because the Postal Service is very good about delivery. We can actually get informed visibility so the Postal Service will send us back an email when it gets put in the mailbox. Okay, they also, we also have uh, an assurance that a decision maker looks at it. So in our family of six, we never let the kids pick up the mail. And I didn't, I might pick up the mail, but I never really looked at it. My wife was the decision maker who threw it in the trash or didn't, right? Even my Bass Pro catalog. You know, I would have thrown her Chadwick's away, but, <laughs> but I didn't have that option. So the decision maker makes the decision. Not only that, but there's engagement at the tactile level. You can feel it. You can smell it. There's 10 times more, there's, there's 10 times more sense receptors in your brain for touch than there is for sight. Okay? And a big principle is that direct mail doesn't throw itself away. Whereas every other media, you know, if you don't see the billboard, you drive by, it's gone. Right? You don't see the banner ad, you drive by, it's gone. Now, it's a little different with TikTok has some good things about it that make it more volitional. You know, you have to get rid of the ones mm -hmm. that you don't like. And it, it it's annoying enough that, that they get it. They get they pick up a little bit. They get a little more of a data set than almost everybody else where you just go. Gee, gee, gee. But anyway, so direct mail doesn't throw itself away. So even when you throw it away. You're making a decision. We have a built-in engagement, and we have a built-in decision by a decision maker, whether they're interested or not. Now, there's still, even when they decide not, there's still a, uh, there's still enough engagement that you know. Uh, Andrew Ettinger talks about a, a, a tree, a tree trimming guy, out on the East Coast who mails twenty thousand pieces every month. Postcards, just inexpensive. And uh, when 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 uh, Tropical Storm Sandy hit, uh, he had so much business he was hiring basically all the other tree trimmers in in the East Coast around him. Now those weren't people that had utilized the service, and they were probably people who'd thrown his 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 cart away every month. But when they had a tree down in their front yard. They said, oh, there's that guy who keeps mailing me that I've never in engaged with placing an order. So there's still an advertising benefit. But, but better than that, we can take the non-buyers and the buyers <clears throat> and we can add variables. What have they bought in the past? What kind of, what kind of neighborhood do they live in? You know, credit history, whatever we want. And we can compare and see what the most important variables are. Now, here's where it gets dangerous. And this is where the AI guys are really losing it, I think. And that is that in my thousands of machine learning models, the biggest job was to throw away the idiotic variables. I mean, we'd throw a lot at the wall, I admit. And every now and then something really hits, like, uh, you know, 
percentage of mobile homes <laughs> was always was very predictive actually I well, don't know a, exactly that's a credit why. that's probably a credit uh, proxy well it could be uh we thought that maybe it was you know we noticed that when somebody bought like a a gibson guitar for mich- for a musician's friend you know it's like a three thousand dollar guitar we kind of wrote you know, wrote our scenario in our minds to tell the story. All of a sudden, that person wouldn't order again for like four years. They'd just go dark. So we figured, you know, the the, the package came to the door. The wife said, now what'd you order? We need a new refrigerator. And, you know, out comes the guitar. Well, a couple of years go by. The divorce is settled. Now, you know... The husband's living in a mobile home. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, and, you know, basically all those independent variables are actually correlated, mm-hmm. you know, dwelling value, household income, high school graduation rate, all that stuff is, is actually not independent at all. But anyway, so, so most of the work is, you know, the biggest, let's say the biggest, well, the first Cabela's model we did, recency didn't come up. Remember, they were they were brutally cutting you off at 12 months, you know, which means you got one or two fishing catalogs. And if you didn't reorder, you know, after you'd gotten all these other catalogs, you finally get a fishing catalog. If you didn't order from that one, you might not get another one. That's, that's 12 months later. So, so the the biggest variable that everybody thought was so important didn't come up. Um, other variables come up, uh, especially when you're doing subscriber models or, you know, low, low value purchases. Um, and, uh, most of it's just nonsense. You know, it'll be like the percentage of disabled veterans over 85 years old in a zip code. Well, no, it's just nothing. So the problem with AI is that it doesn't know it doesn't in general know the good from the bad variables. Now they can do some validation and they do. Um, But it just doesn't understand what it's, you know, it doesn't have any understanding of what it's doing. And so about, about 80 or 90% of the work of modeling is, is trying to tell a story with it. And I've been tested, well, musician's friend tested 11 times against eight different modeling companies. And the last one was against the UCLA stats faculty and they accused me of cheating uh because i beat them by 31 per 321 percent on a on a uniques test which is a way to test one model against another so uh i wasn't cheating but it, it it's it's the scary downside of modeling being done by either someone who doesn't understand anything about marketing or someone who doesn't understand you know, either either no one at all, you know, either AI on its own or someone who doesn't understand offers and customers and any well, of that kind. So explain so explain that. So like how does understanding marketing context inform model building? Like how were you able to achieve better targeting results by understanding the context? Well, as I said, one way is to look at the trivial. The other way is after a couple of hundred models, you get some concept of what does make sense. You can also inside of the model, we use a Bayesian formula, which lets you see the both the profitability of each cell, but also the discrete definition of each cell. So unlike AI, where you're looking for repeated paths, and you don't really know what's what's involved in the path uh, that in a neural net model, um, you you do get to see what it's doing, you know, regression, you see what it's doing, but it's you know, it's like, what's the most important variable? And then what's the second most important? And the world doesn't work like that. You know, the world, the most important variable, one end of a model might be really a different thing than the, the other end. And so you kind of, you kind of learn what, what is reasonable. And then, and then, you know, there's also the validation. So what we do when we build a model is we take half, we have, you know, typically with catalog companies, again, not only do they have rich data, but they mail enough because once you're trying to run the presses for something like this, it helps to have hundreds of thousands going through because the setup takes a bit. 
And so you, you know, you basically expense that capital, that capital investment over a bigger number of catalogs. So, uh, so if you have a couple of hundred thousand catalogs, you take 100,000 of the people you mailed, set them aside and you take the other hundred thousand of the people you mailed and you model with it. And then every time you get a model, you say, well, okay, so what if we would have used this model on this population as they looked at the time we mailed it, we roll it back in time, and then we look at how it did and see if the results match up. And that would be possible to do in AI if they had the label data set, which they mostly don't. So, you, so you're saying that it's really the data set integrity that is the greatest challenge for integrating AI in marketing today? I would say so. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can integrate AI, you know, in copywriting or in uh, image creation or in, you know, other things. But if you're going to actually try to figure out who's worth targeting or who's worth retargeting, then the la you really need the label data. Set. Right. And and how do you separate, well, for, just, just for the audience, how do you separate machine learning and AI? Um, AI was coined in the early 50s, and it meant anything that a, a machine could do that looked like it was <laughs> its not stupid, right? So most of programming in those days was considered AI. Uh, we didn't look for sentience. We just looked for uh, reasonable repetition, right? So, so uh, AI is the general term. Machine learning is really that differentiating factors puzzle, uh, where we actually try to try to get smarter. Um, the problem is machines don't really learn. They really show you the correlations. You know, the the, the lower p values are higher correlate are the probability the probability of non correlation. So the lower the number, the better. I don't know if that makes any sense. But. That was a little bit, yeah, that was a little bit complicated for me, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think okay. what I'm understanding is that you mean them generally interchangeably that machine learning and, and AI in, at least in this context. Well, machine learning is actually a, a, a higher level of AI, but, um, you know, the, 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 because it is because it is trying to come to a conclusion. AI isn't necessarily trying to do that. Um, what we've come to mean by AI in 2023 has more to do with machine learning than it does the earlier definitions. I'll say that. So, yeah, you could use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, that's very interesting. I know at least for my little area, we are using machine learning for for targeting. And I think there's various data science, like, uh, what would you call them? Like various practices to reduce multicollinearity. And in, in addition, they review those variables that are being included with us, with the business team for that context. And one of, and recently actually, we were taking a look at our models and there were some variables that were a little bit concerning because they didn't seem like, you know, because when you look at the variables, that's the secret sauce. That is what, how do you really know that somebody's a good customer for your business? And right. it requires that business context to say, that makes sense that that's our secret sauce. And, or that's ridiculous that you, that like you want that variable to determine a good customer. So, um, right. Trying to boil it down is almost never the right answer. It is in prospecting, um, you know, uh, Abacus and Weiland, they share, they share data and, you know, they do have a variable that's, you know, if I send out a catalog, I can tell what people bought from me. Right. But when they get older, they haven't bought from me in three or four years. I don't know what else they're buying. You know, so they might be buying from me, I'm Land's End, then they stop, but th now they're buying from Eddie Bauer, or now they're buying from L.L. Bean, um, and maybe, or maybe someone else. So in these large 
data co-ops, you can find out that they're still active. So if we had our choice and we have a, a set of a million four-year-old buyers that we don't know if they're valuable or not, and we can't really tell because they bought once, they didn't spend much, you know, spend four years. So there isn't a lot that even our first party data knows. Something like that, which is sort of more like the third party data, but shows that, oh, they're very, very active. If, so if I have a million names, I can say, well, let's take the most active. Let's match them against this data set with that variable. And they call it propensity to buy or something. And, you know, and it's it's ranked because some of those people in the in the co-op have bought 20 times, some 10, some five, some two. So you can say, well, let's take those 20 time buyers and maybe the 10 time buyers and get the ones that match in our million. And now maybe we've only got, you know, 50,000 and, uh, and, and give them a test or 10,000, give them a test. And it turns out that usually that's a pretty profitable way to, to work your way down into that, into that old millions of mm -hmm. names. Makes sense. Right. Even though it's just one main variable, but it's a really powerful one because it's looking outside of your first party. Mm -hmm. data. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, what about have you done holdout testing in your um, in your time running, you know, these analytics, basically looking at, you know, let's say we're mailing people um, and for every you know, 10 people we're mailing, one is not going to get our piece of mail. And then... Oh, yeah. I'm a huge believer in holdout testing. It's really the way to prove a channel value. It's, it's the only real way, if, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, you look at uh, what happened with Uber, you know, when they accidentally stopped all their, uh, all their digital advertising for a week. And it was just perfectly... <laughs> No, no impact whatsoever. Now that doesn't mean over time there wouldn't be an impact. You know, you got to be careful with that. I've had clients who I show them an order curve and I show them how when a catalog mails and it goes down and then there's wave after wave after wave and the, and you get this sort of baseline activity that each catalog sort of layers on top of as it peters out. And they and the accounting people will come to the conclusion that well we've mailed a bunch of catalogs in the first two quarters, let's just coast the rest of the year. Well, when you stop, different things mm -hmm. happen. It doesn't work the same. Uh, but that said, that there's a caveat, that's the best way. And uh, with Musician's Friend, they were owned by Guitar Center, who believed every <laughs> guitar that got bought through the catalog was stolen from their store. Hmm. So they hated the catalog and they always wanted to cancel it. And they were owned by a, by a, a private equity company in Dubai or someplace. <laughs> so they had no direct mail context at all. And so they would always say, you know, why are, why is this company spending $10 million a year on these catalogs? Well, the answer was because they were doing $500 million worth of sales <laughs> from those catalogs. It was a great deal. But every year we would, I, 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 I handled all their customer circulation for six years and, uh, and it got it kind of accidentally kind of won the, the client. They were converting their ERP system and, and were up to their eyeballs trying to do it. And they, they said, we're, we're pretty sure we can get it done in six months more, but could you do this for six months? It took six years. Wow. <laughs> But anyway, so they, they kept us around and they liked us too. The IT department loved it that they didn't have to talk to the marketing people anymore. But um, but the private equity firm, you know, would be like, why are we spending this? So every every year we would do, you know, we were doing about 600,000 pieces per month and we would have to drop out 30,000 and 10,000 would be dropped out for a month. 20,000 or 30,000 would be dropped out for a month, then 20,000 would be dropped out for another month, and then 10,000 would be dropped out. So only 10,000 were dropped out for three successive mm -hmm. months, right? Makes sense. And uh, we, we always saw that it was well worth the, the, the expense of the catalog. 
comparing the re the downstream results of those customers versus the downstream results of uh, of the ones who got mailed. Now we did have an it, I had another client, um, Daniel Smith, and they had hired a bunch of uh, young direct digital marketing people because they were wanted to they wanted to increase the number of customers. And so they did a lot of, they sold artistic supplies. So they commissioned a lot of uh, influencers in art, in, in, you know, art painting pictures and stuff. And uh, a, a year or so, a year and a half had gone by and the owner, I was happened to be there uh, working with the catalog people. And the owner said, why don't you go down to the basement and talk to these people and see if you, see if they know what they're doing. Well, I found out right away that they, they didn't know much about business, just pure business, because they said, well, we, you know, we spent about a million dollars on this affinity program, but we've generated more than a million dollars in sales. So we know we're breaking even. Well, of course, that isn't break even because you've got cost of goods, right? You've got cost of order processing, plus you've got advertising cost, which was that they spent a million dollars. If you spend a million and you only get a million, you're not breaking even, <laughs> not in anything, right? And so uh, it was clear they didn't know what they were doing. But the scariest part came later. I talked to the owner and I said, you know, what I'm concerned about is they they recommended that that the influencers offer 20% off and you don't generally discount price. So I wonder when you do that, which is another question on the AB split story, you know, if we gave 50% off, what does that do to our customer base? You know, does it train them to do that? So I buy a lot from Land's End. I love Land's End. They nail me right here at the office. See? And on here it says 40% off, right? So I went online and I thought, well, good, I'll get 40% off. There was a 50% off. Woohoo! So they just undermined the catalog because now it looks like, oh, I just happened to show up and they'll track me to that mm -hmm. offer and I will not be. Who knows? Depends on how good mm -hmm. they are, right? Depends on if they do a matchback. Depends on if they know that I basically have been with them since the 70s. But anyway... So, so now I know to wait for a 50% off, right, which they will give me. And, uh, and so we, what we did was we took, and this is again, not valid. It's not an AB split, but we said, okay, what was a cohort before these guys started doing this kind of marketing? What was a new customer worth in the next six months? So we'll take we'll take a calendar year's worth of customers and we'll see what they were worth for the next six months. See, does it make sense? And then we'll take this last 12 months where they've been giving away the store and see what those people are worth in repeat buy. Just the repeat, not the first time buy. Well, it turned out they were worth about 25% of what a new customer used to be hmm. worth. And so we saw a lot, and this has been repeated um, by other consultants uh, in other catalog companies, where a healthy company said, well, we can acquire a customer for a fraction in digital what we were acquiring from in renting lists and mailing catalogs. So let's cut out the catalog for acquisition. We'll mail the catalog to our customers. And what, we, and what they found was, if they were paying attention, was they were generating just as many names as always, spending less, it's a great deal. But then how did they do downstream? And and they got into this spiral. And so a lot of them actually went under because all of a sudden they weren't, they weren't bringing in the same quality of customer, scary thing. We also have found consistently that if a if a catalog uses Amazon to acquire new customers, that those customers are maybe not even worth mailing at all, that they're really a one and done. You know, when I asked, my wife was complaining about a dress she bought from Amazon this morning because the colors weren't as vibrant as it had looked online, you know, and I could tell she was right. But, you know, screens are that way. 
screens can be made to pop and made to not pop. Uh, they're very, 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 very careful in catalogs to portray those colors as they exist in the real world. You know, I mean, we used to just drive ourselves nuts. And now Quad, who I think prints Land's End, I can find out, you know, Quad actually does the photography for a lot of catalogs. They do for L.L. Bean, I know that. I'm not sure about Land's End, but I know they do it for Quad, for Colony brands. Um, and so we've got the we've got the photographer and the printer, the same electronic thing carrying along and making sure that when it gets to you, it looks like what it really is, which is more difficult on Amazon. But my point is, is that my wife said, I bought it from Amazon. Now, did she buy it from Land's End doing closeouts on Amazon? I, I don't know. She probably doesn't mm -hmm. know. You know, my kids who buy on Amazon a lot, they don't think about the vendor, the merchant who made the thing. They don't think about the brand even, mostly. They just think, oh, I bought it on Amazon. So we've lost some of that downstream value. And if you're a cataloger acquiring customers that way, those customers do not think of you the same way as the customer that got your catalog in the mail. But yeah, big fan of holdout testing, even more a fan of uniques testing. And I'm a huge fan of in the mail, not back testing. I like that. Back testing is a fiction. Hmm. And I've been fired because of it. Tell us more about that. Well, it's not, it's, it took me a while to figure it out because I always modeled to, for the mail. We'd go in the mail, we'd get the results, we'd have real results, standard results. And, uh, well, that was at Musician's Friend where they had tested me 11 times and I keep beating the pants off of everybody else. But by then, they'd finally converted their ERP and they fired everybody in Medford where the company was founded and they moved. They moved the company down to L.A. because they said they could hire better people that way. And they got a new VP of marketing, and he wanted a new database company. He couldn't believe somebody in Milwaukee would know what they were doing. And so uh, and so I got a call, and they said, you're fired. And then I got a call a year later saying, the results have gone to crap since you were fired. <laughs> did they test against you? And I said, well, they told me they did a back test. Well, a back test is... My model, my first try at a model, with all of the spurious correlation left in, right? So when I, when I validate and process and throw out the silly stuff before we mail, when I do that, right, it, it degrades the apparent lift on the reports, you know? So it'll say the model is worth this when I start, and gradually it's getting less and less valuable, but it's getting more and more likely to work. So when you, when you only back test, you're tweaking it so that it has the maximum lift, even if it doesn't work, you know, it's, it's crazy mm -hmm. variables. And, uh, and there isn't enough of that. <laughs> there isn't enough of that reality dumped on enough models, but it's good if you can see the variables and then at least you have some idea. Yeah, and I think also the there's that practice of splitting your data set into the test and the training sets so that, you know, that's, I think to reduce the likelihood of those spurious correlations. But yeah, real-time real yeah. testing is super valuable and definitely necessary after the back testing to confirm you know how, how accurate what were these models yeah real world i'm i'm a uh, i'm against real-time testing as a as a as a terminology because of course it's all historical mm -hmm. i know what it means i just i just mm -hmm. laugh at it you know because it's it's really short yeah. time <laughs> that's true i know uh, I've lost lots of clients because I talk too much. No. But, yeah. Climate. Uh, all the time. I told Dick Cabela he had too many fishing lures <laughs> in his catalog. How, how did that go? Yeah. I don't know. Probably not well. I told him he had too many MBAs he was hiring. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize that he was trying to go public. So he had his own mm -hmm. agenda. He didn't, he didn't care anymore about how well it worked so much as how well the market 
the financial markets perceived it would work, which is a different question. Yeah, you're, you're talking about sort of like the technical, um, you're much more on that like uh, meritocratic side you're you're playing you you play things very like uh fairly and uh i think i think you're very honest and i think there that sometimes that can turn people off we have i have an article out on linkedin that's called integrity as a modeling variable <laughs> <laughs> but it's a little bit like uh, you know um honey i shrunk the kids you know, or the second one, even even more, where the financial guys, you know, have kicked out the people who mm -hmm. knew anything, and then a disaster ensues, and you know, who's going to solve it? Is it going to be the people who know something? And and that is a problem with modeling, uh, and I think it it slowed the adoption because the, the the marketing VP doesn't understand what's going on. Well, at LoveSac, we did wonderful work of integrating their their web and their digital and their uh, direct mail and um, and grew they grew like crazy uh, when they got this down and went public and it's then continued with that program that we built but about six months i was there not even six months about three months i was there and patrick santangelo was the new vp of marketing and he said uh john from what we can tell our biggest hurdle is that people don't know what we sell, you know, and once they know what we, what we offer, we, we compete head to head with Wayfair and Williams Sonoma and other uh, online furniture companies. So this catalog you're helping us with is mailed to our current customers who know what we sell. Shouldn't we take that money and spend it on showing new people what we sell rather than reinforcing people who've already bought from us and already know? And I said, Patrick, that's one of the better questions I've ever been asked. It's probably one of the best, you know. Would you like to know the answer? And he was from a package goods company. He had no mail experience. And he said, you can know the answer? <laughs> I said, yeah, you can actually know for sure. He said, how do you do that? <clears throat> I said, well, the way you do it is you take your couple of hundred thousand that you were planning to mail and let's not mail some of them. And we'll be very, very careful about how we, you know, don't mail some of the best ones and don't mail some of the middle ones and don't mail some of the worst ones. But the ones we were mailing, we do a <clears throat> highly, highly careful holdout test and see how they do and see what's going on. And what happened was um, we had about a 300% EBITDA uh, return on investment on the catalog spent. So the people who were mailed the catalog, the, I mean, the, the set of people did 300% better profitably than the people who weren't mailed. Okay. So he said, well, maybe we should keep that going. So we did, but we continued to do matchback testing. And one of the things we saw in the matchback, not in the holdup, but the bigger context, was a lot of people, a lot of next door neighbors. I mean, the guy running the matchback actually came to me and said, I see like, you know, one, two, three Main Street and one, two, five Main Street. You know, so it didn't match. It's not who we mailed, it's a different person, name. But it's really, really close, like the next house or, you know, apartment 354 and apartment 355 in the same building, different person places the order. So I asked Patrick, you know, do you mind if we include those? And he said, well, run it both ways so we can see, you know, the impact of it. And uh, it turned out that it was a 900 percent EBITDA return on investment, 900%. And uh, it turned out that for every one repeat order we got, we got two new orders that didn't match precisely, but matched loosely. And so we, we speculated that what was happening was that the catalog was getting passed along. You know, people come over for a glass of wine and they'd say, this is a weird couch. Oh yeah, it's really weird. In fact, you can reconfigure it. 
and you could carry it up the stairs, even though nothing else would fit up the stairs. You know, you could have a whole room couch, whereas, you know, in a, in a really small stairway brownstone or something. And uh, and so, you know, they'd say, well, yeah, where do you get that? Oh, I got a catalog right here, you know, an extra one because I've been mailing them every month. It, it, it gives them a vehicle that they're not afraid to give away, just like they're not afraid to throw it away. Mm -hmm. You know, they were fixing to float, throw it away, but since you're here, here, cool. have this. <laughs> and it's, you know, back in the early, early days of computers and matching and merge purge, the argument was that it would be better instead of mailing two, two catalogs on the same day to the same house, which sounds like a waste, it would be better to mail one catalog to that house and one catalog to a different house. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. But we would test, <laughs> we would test it and it never had a better response rate. And it's like, well, how could that be possible? Well, and cause what you do is let's say you were renting 40 lists, 40 different prospect lists. Now you'd have some people getting six, some people five, you know, some people were on all of those. And if you didn't merge purge them, you'd be mailing out tons of catalogs repeat. But what happened was they were much more likely to pass them along. And a pass along had a much higher likelihood to generate an order than anything else. So what we learned to do is mail them in waves. And so that, you know, the, the number one thing that merge purge helped with was the complaints. Like, why are you sending me all these... <laughs> Why are you sending me six catalogs? And people would send them back mm -hmm. in packs. It's... But but the reality is that good things happen when you mail people who like catalogs more catalogs. And still to this day, though we've we've tuned our way out of that stuff. John, I want to thank you again for coming on the podcast. It was so fun to chat with you and learn about your history and all of these things about direct marketing and measurement and um, just in general data. So I want to thank you again, and um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on. It's the old stuff, the forgotten mm -hmm. lore. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.